our nature to explore, to go places no one has ever dreamed, to redefine what is possible. It is our calling to create, to transform the world around us, to plant the seeds of change. It is our responsibility to disrupt, to laugh in the face of conformity, to create our own reality. It is our duty to lead, to show strength when others are weak, to trust ourselves when everyone doubts. We are the brave souls that are changing our culture, our economy, and redrawing the lines of the future. We are the entrepreneurs, and our greatest rewards have yet to come. Every year, thousands of entrepreneurs choose well-established, successful, nationally recognized corporate brand names like U-Haul dealerships to be successful in their own business careers. With over 16,000 active dealers across America, U-Haul, founded in 1945, has been successful in renting trucks, trailers, and others provide pieces of equipment in many U-Haul dealerships, also self-storage units, among other services. But in 2006, one of those thousands of hardworking entrepreneurs and U-Haul dealers, Lee Robinson, owner of Downtown Self Storage since 2001, finally got fed up with U-Haul's poor service and lack of corporate support and terminated his dealership contract with U-Haul and signed up with budget. U-Haul sued Robinson's business under the non-competition clause in their contract. The dealer took the position that the non-competition language was in violation of California law. And under California Business and Professions Code 16600, anti-competition clauses are void and unenforceable in the state of California. Now, this wasn't the first time U-Haul had sued a former dealer under the same illegal clause. In fact, no court in the state of California has ever once ruled that U-Haul's non-competition clauses are enforceable. And U-Haul knew that. Because in 1985, our federal government filed a complaint against U-Haul. That complaint said that U-Haul sued its competitors without a valid reason trying to create a monopoly and harass its competitors. Our government also said U-Haul had pursued a deliberate course of action to abuse the judicial process in order to injure a competitor. And only two years later, in 1987, our federal government issued an order that says, U-Haul must stop filing lawsuits intended to harass or injure a competitor. U-Haul then dismissed their lawsuit knowing full well they would lose, but not before costing the dealer, Lee Robinson, tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees. Because U-Haul dismissed the suit before there had been a judicial determination, Robinson wasn't able to collect his attorney's fees under the dealership contract. When Robinson learned that this was a standard practice for U-Haul, he sued them for malicious prosecution. And that's where this story gets very interesting. The jury in Robinson versus U-Haul found that U-Haul's original lawsuit brought against downtown self-storage was malicious and brought for an improper purpose. They ruled that Robinson was entitled to recover his attorney's fees and to receive general damages. They also determined that U-Haul had no trade secrets as they had claimed. The judge then ruled as a matter of law that the non-competition clause in U-Haul's dealer contract is illegal and unenforceable. U-Haul dealers throughout California can now do what Robinson did when he was dissatisfied with U-Haul give U-Haul a 30-day dealer termination notice and switch immediately to being a dealer for one of the other truck rental companies. 
Robinson versus U-Haul was a lengthy battle, but the outcome is good news for the people of California. It will increase competition and result in better deals and service for consumers. It may even be good news for U-Haul, who will have to compete fairly and treat its dealers fairly if it wants to keep them. This case is significant because an industry giant had to stop bullying the little guys. Who says you can't get justice? Today, the Insider Exclusive Investigative News Team visits with Matthew and Rebecca Freeman, Lee Robinson's lawyers, to go behind the headlines in this truly epic David versus Goliath courtroom battle in U-Haul Dealers Expose, Lee Robinson's story. Matt and Rebecca have earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as two of the finest trial lawyers in Northern California and across the nation. And because of that, they are driven to fight for people who have been harmed by the willful and negligent actions of others. Their goals, not only to get justice for their clients, but to ensure that everyone is treated fairly and equitably in the eyes of the law. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Santa Rosa, California. It is my great pleasure to introduce Matt and Rebecca Freeman. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. So we here we are in Santa Rosa, beautiful Santa Rosa. You have a law firm here. What type of law do you generally practice? We only represent plaintiffs. We don't represent corporations. We don't represent insurance companies. Yeah. And we also only represent people who we like and people whose cases we believe in. Yeah. So we r really reject most of the phone calls that come to us. Now, when we talk about plaintiffs, we're talking about the average citizen, the average person, okay, not the major businesses. Correct. You could have a choice. You could work, be general counsel to IBM or, you know, Google or something like that, but you choose to represent the underprivileged, the oppressed. Why is that, Matt? You know, uh, every courthouse has two doors to it. And there's one door, and that is the door where the corporations walk in, the wealthy, the uh, insurance companies, those who can afford to pay four or $500 an hour and hire mm. a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And our clients can't walk in that door. The other door over the top says contingency fee. And that's the door where you don't need any money to walk into. And we, if we believe in our clients, then we our partners with them. Yeah. We rise and fall with them and we believe in their case and it doesn't take any money to get the representation. Mm -hmm. And those are the people we represent. You brought up a very interesting word, contingency fee. This is a case, we're here today to talk about a David and Goliath case against a major corporation in America, U-Haul, uh, and an individual dealer, one of 16,000 dealers out there that they have who decided enough was enough, right? Correct and you took on this case. Now, these kind of cases, when you're talking about contingency, these kind of cases, if you lose the case after you invested a lot of time and cost and everything, you're out money. You're out a lot of things, right? Right. In this particular case, tell us about your client. First of all, Lee Robinson. Who is Lee? What kind of person is he? Lee Robinson is unusual probably as a U-Haul dealer. U-Haul mm -hmm. dealers are typically mom and pops who own a gas station or a storage facility or a mini market mm -hmm. and they uh, partner up with U-Haul to add on to the money or bring in extra clients, but they're generally not sophisticated business people. Uh, Lee Robinson is a very kind, successful self-made businessman mm -hmm. and uh, because of that he saw what U-Haul was doing what U-Haul tried to do to him and he said I'm not putting up with it yeah and you're not going to do that here and you're not going to do that to me and he decided to start an eight-year battle right so let's talk about this case Rebecca when you mentioned Matt 
he saw what U-Haul was trying to do to him and trying to do successfully against other dealers. What were they doing? They were uh, making people sign these contracts that said, if you decide not to become a U-Haul dealer, that's fine, but you can't open any other competing dealer. People would sign that, not understanding yeah. that at all. But then U-Haul would mistreat the people by, for example, um, they would lead business to their corporate-owned stores so the little mom and pop people didn't get the, the calls. Mm. They also weren't maintaining the trucks. And so the trucks would show up, you know, a person to make a reservation, the trucks would show up in terrible disrepair. And often, sometimes they wouldn't even be showing up at all. So the people who were running the mom and pop stores, uh, Joe comes in to get his truck, it's not there. Joe gets mad, he's taking it out on them, screaming at them, they're calling you haul what's going on. And so the people would often try to get out of the contracts because U-Haul wasn't stepping up, U-Haul wasn't doing what they were supposed to be doing. When they would stop competing, then they would open up a, a competing business. A lot of times these were self-storage units, yeah. so people needed the trucks. As soon as they would open the competing business, U-Haul would sh sue them and shut them down. And most of the people that this happened to in California gave up because they couldn't afford an attorney to fight U-Haul. Right, because the average cost of fighting a lawsuit you're sued might be, I would guess, $25,000 to right. start out, right? Right, and we talked to some people who tried to. Now let's, they tried to fight and they gave up after five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. They couldn't foot the bill anymore. Yeah. Now let's get back to the contract and the clause, which is called the non-competition clause. First of all, their clause, and the government told them over the years, was illegal to insert in the contract, right? Yes. Yes. In California, non-competition clauses, with a few exceptions that did not apply here, yeah. are against public policy. And, and, and the few exceptions are, for example, if you work, I just saw a case when we were coming up here, um, a researcher uh, uh, at UC San Diego, I think, left and went to USC. And he had done extensive amount of work on Alzheimer drug research and he brought all that research to USC well right away the court said hey he, that's a trade secret right and that's one exception isn't it trade secrets that is arguably one exception okay it's not even that clear-cut and in our case that's what you haul they tried to use that too they tried to use that <laughs> and, and, um, and by the way how did they try to use it they said operating a truck or a, a, a U-Haul dealership is a big trade secret, isn't it? <laughs> they said um, some really funny things. They said, our way of doing business, you know, we've, we've developed this over years, line them, shine them, uh, you know, which was a trade secret. The fact that they had low decks was a trade secret, even though on yeah. the back of the trucks it says, our decks are low. Yeah. Um, they said the prices was a trade secret, and they their prices were advertised online and everywhere, so <laughs> it was... Um, Did you, when you went to trial, were some jurors kind of like snickering a little bit when they heard this? I think some of them were <laughs> snickering a little bit. I mean, it's so ridiculous. Yeah, it was ridiculous. I know the judge was yeah. absolutely amused. Yeah. It, now, it, Lee's case is a little bit different. You mentioned some dealers who terminated their contract and tried to open up a competitive, like budget or something like that, right? Um, were shut down because they couldn't afford the legal fees. Um, Lee answered the complaint when he was sued by U-Haul, didn't he? He did. He was willing to stand up and he was willing to take him on. And tell us what happened after that. Well, uh, Lee won. Yeah. In the underlying suit. Uh, they Won said in the sense that U-Haul dismissed the case, didn't right. they? So in other words, they realized they didn't have a case. They saw someone willing to stand up to them, and they dismissed the case. Right. Correct. But your case is what happened after that, isn't it? Right. We sued U-Haul after, U-Haul sued Lee Robinson saying you can't, you can quit. We don't care if you're not a U-Haul dealer, but you can't open a competing business. Yeah. Uh, and Lee Robinson said baloney, and he hired us. Yeah. And at that point, he paid by the hour to be defended. Yeah. Uh, during that process, he got, one, tired of spending the money, but halfway through aggressively fighting U-Haul, U-Haul said, you know what? We don't want to play anymore. We're going home. We're dismissing the case. We're out of here. Now, what's the, to Lee Robinson, how did that affect him? 
he was angry because by that time he'd spent about over fifty thousand dollars in legal fees. Yeah, and he says, "Well, um, you're not starting a fight and walking away. What you what you've done is wrong." Yeah, he couldn't recover that money in attorneys' fees because they dismissed the case. Right. Correct. Correct. Okay. So what'd you do then? We sued U-Haul. We being Lee Robinson, mm -hmm. and we represented him. Sued U-Haul for what's called for two things. One, malicious prosecution. Yeah which means that you filed that lawsuit without a reasonable basis for believing it yeah. had merit. Yes. And then we also sued him for violation of, um, for unfair business practices. Mm -hmm. And in California, you are not allowed to engage in blatantly unfair business practices that stifle competition mm -hmm. and is against public policy. It's bad for California. It's bad for the economy. Now, this wasn't news to you, Hall, was it? I mean, they had done this before, right? They had done it before. And the federal government had stepped in and right. even in, uh, had instructed them right. not to do this again, right? The Federal Trade Commission actually had an, a court order from 1970-something yeah. that we found that prohibited U-Haul from engaging in sham litigation mm -hmm. in order to injure their competitors. So they'd been doing this for decades, and it'd been working for decades. I mean, they were they, they, one of the reasons they were so profitable was because they literally did keep their competitors from being competitive. Mm -hmm. And nobody prior to your client had really stood up to you all, had they? They tried. Uh, yeah. And what would happen is they'd get ground into, ground into the ground. Uh, yeah. By legal fees. Right. And we, yeah. we deposed, we interviewed, and we actually became friends with some of those former dealers who you all yeah. had sued and had stood up to them. But without exception, you all either uh, took so much advantage of the litigation process yeah. and uh, fought everything, made it so expensive for those dealers to yeah. defend themselves that they ran out of money and stopped and just said, okay, I, I, don't, I will shut down our budget dealership. Right. Uh, and the other ones, if they did hang in there, U-Haul would do what they did to Lee Robinson, halfway through the process, say, okay. We're, we're dismissing, we're going home. And the law is if they dismiss the case, you can't recover attorney's fees, correct? With correct. some exceptions. Is that under the law or under the contract that they had with U-Haul? Which one? It's both. Um, there is a code of civil procedure in California that the prevailing party in certain cases can get their attorney's fees. Right. And in this case, uh, Lee Robinson finally, in the malicious prosecution, when he sued Lee U-Haul, and we went to the jury trial, and he won. The court ordered him um, over $800,000 in attorney's fees because it was eight years of aggressive litigation. And uh, the court found that Lee Robinson had done a public good. He, mm -hmm. They'd forced U-Haul to stop this practice, right. and that's what eventually happened. Let me ask you a question. I saw in 1985, and I think again in 1987, the U.S. government had stepped in and said, U-Haul, you can't have this sham litigation trying to force people out of business, okay? Um, your case was, what year, 2000 and? Well, it started in, uh, it's seven? going on eight years. It's so my question is, you have the federal government almost 20 years before had said we recognize that U-Haul is engaging in this sham litigation. Obviously that is presented in a case. Why isn't a judge saying, hey, this looks like the same thing and ruling on it rather quickly in the, in the court proceedings rather than dragging it out so long? Because you have to prove that it's sham litigation. You have to prove that it's malicious prosecution. That's, is that right? That's correct. U-Haul has the right to engage in litigation. They're yeah. a multi-billion, with a B, yeah. dollar corporation. Yeah. And uh, they engage in litigation, and no doubt a lot of it is valid litigation every year, every yeah. day. But you can't engage in malicious litigation. You can't use the court system to oppress your competitors. Yeah. And, so, but that oppression has to be proven. Yeah. So let's talk about what is malicious litigation, malicious prosecution. What do you have to prove? You have to prove that, in this case, we had to prove that U-Haul filed the lawsuit knowing that the things that were alleged in the lawsuit were not true, and they did it for a purpose that was um, to oppress competitors 
and no other reason. Yeah, and how do you prove that? Well, we took a lot of depositions. We went around the country. We talked to all kinds of other U-Haul dealers. Victims. Um, we asked them, tell us what these trade secrets are. We took yeah. the depositions of their persons most knowledgeable about these trade secrets. And they literally said the most ridiculous things about what the trade secrets were, like literally keep the trucks clean and yeah. line them up. And basically, um, the reason it took so long was because this wasn't for a judge. This was for a jury. Yeah. And we had to wait to get to the jury trial. And U-Haul, like I say, they had so much money that they kept filing every possible motion to delay it. Yeah. They, they filed anti-slap motions and this and that. And then when we would win those, they would appeal those. So the appeal process in California takes over a year. So th yeah. this case would be on hold for a year, waiting for it to get through the appellate process. It's on appeal now. We won the jury trial. They appealed that. So the case is still, U-Haul is still. Right. What is the verdict, by the way, that you won? Um, the verdict itself was uh, just under 200000 yeah. and then an additional... 800 and some thousand for attorney's fees that Lee Robinson had incurred. Yeah. So the verdict itself is slightly over a million. Right. And the more important verdict, this is what Lee Robinson wanted, was uh, that we also got a, an injunction prohibiting U-Haul from putting in this clause in their contract for non-competition. And mm -hmm. that was really great because all these other mom and pop uneducated people who are dealing with U-Haul wouldn't know this, but no, they're not allowed to do that anymore. For everybody that's watching this story right now, if they're a U-Haul dealer and sign one of those old contracts, is that old contract still valid or has U-Haul sent them a new contract revising and taking out? That's, that? a, uh, that's a wonderful question because when we were trying to get the judge to order this permanent injunction, U-Haul yes. uh, filed a declaration to the court they lied to the court. They said, you don't need to do this, Judge, because we've sent a letter to all of our U-Haul dealers saying, we're never going to enforce this, so don't worry about it. So we went out and interviewed U-Haul dealers. Did you ever get this uh, letter saying it's not enforceable? No, yeah. no, but it, it was a blatant lie. Yeah. And b that so you brought also, that to the judge's attention? We did, and the judge was angry, and the judge gave us the permanent injunction that we asked for. Mm -hmm. So are they, as a result of this case, are they required to notify all existing U-Haul dealers right now that that clause is not legal, or do they have to say, have them sign another contract or what? N neither of those. Neither. We tried for that, but what we ended up getting is a an injunction prohibiting U-Haul from enforcing or threatening to enforce its mm -hmm. non-competition clause. Mm -hmm. um, this fall all falls under this unfair business practices that a lot of Goliaths out there, major corporations sometimes utilize. How, when, when, a, when a judge hears, like in this case, the Lee Robinson case, the tactics that they use, and other judges have heard other cases too, what is, what is going through that judge's mind, like the judge you had? You said he got angry. Okay, did he sanction them? Did he fine them? Sometimes he did. Uh, you know, with for example, and they appeal that too. Don't they, they do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'd love to uh, go out to a cocktail party with this judge and see what he says now. But since the litigation is still pending, he doesn't talk to us right. in a way. But we saw him visibly angry. We what are they appealing? It. The award for malicious prosecution, or the verdict for the two hundred thousand dollars? They're they're not appealing the malicious prosecution. They're appealing. You know what they're appealing? They're appealing the injunction. The, the unfair injunction. business, the unfair business practices act. They're appealing that the the injunction that prohibits them from trying to enforce this clause. <laughs> but it's illegal in the state of California, particularly since they don't have any trade secrets that they pass on to anybody, right? Right. Correct. So how can they uh, how can they be appealing that? You know, they're appealing it for more delay, yeah. and they don't want to pay it. The so is it still in their contracts? It is. You know? it is, yeah. It is. As far as we know. I yeah. mean, I haven't seen a contract in a while, but as far as we know, it's in there. Uh, they changed the wording because the contract said, paraphrasing, uh, you cannot open a competing business yeah. for this period of time. Yeah. 
then they changed it unless pro and they added unless prohibited by law or yeah. a phrase similar to that uh, and then the judge got angry at that and we yeah. as did we saying well how does mom and pop how does the mini mart owner the yeah. gas station owner know uh, what's prohibited by law in California are they yeah. required to to hire an attorney right. and to research and to find out if this clause is valid or not mm -hmm. it's another game if you uh, either take it out or say uh, this is clause doesn't apply to anybody in California. Right. Say what you mean if you have if you're in good faith. Mm -hmm. And we never saw that happen. You know, um, as we were researching this show, we came across these terms: malicious prosecution and abuse of process. What's the difference? Te uh, you know, technically, they're I'm similar. not sure there is a the difference. Abuse yeah. of the legal process. One form of abuse of yeah. the legal process is filing lawsuits that you know are non-meritorious. Yeah. If you are filing a lawsuit for no valid reason but to uh, oppress or harass your opponent, that's an abusive process. Yeah. Do you ever had, was there ever any settlement talks in this case? Yes, it okay. was pretty interesting. So talk to me about your, let's say I'm the opposing counsel here and you know darn well that they are representing a, they're, they're using tactics which are ridiculous, unfair, deceptive, et cetera. Do you ever have those exact words, communication with the opposing counsel? That's a very good question. The opposing <laughs> counsel and Matthew, uh, their relationship was so uh, bad <laughs> that they couldn't really talk. Do you, how do you prepare your your clients in cases like that when they're going to be cross-examined or deposed? Well, you know, we do a three-day witness prep and uh, literally three days and mm -hmm. we, we have our clients before we even begin the witness prep, they yeah. come to us about what their fears and concerns are about the case and yeah. everyone has it, whether it's just speaking in front of a camera because all the video, all our depositions are videotaped right. or what are your concerns? And then we go through it, and it's half a um, psychology counseling session. And yeah. then we do a hard prep where an attorney from our office will uh, will go after the client and do it so aggressively, yeah. it's likely much worse than the client will ever see in the deposition. Sure. And, and then we, we uh, finally, the last thing we do is we tell our client, uh, as we're walking that deposition, We'll make a promise to you. One is that we will not walk in that door with you if we don't think you're ready for that deposition. Right. We'll cancel it. We'll continue it. And if you look at me or Rebecca and you say, you know what, I don't feel up to it today. I didn't sleep well. I'm nervous still. Yeah. I don't want to go in there today. We will cancel it even if it's at the five minutes before it starts and we'll reschedule it and we won't walk in there until you're ready. Yeah. Well, congratulations on winning the case. Thank you. When do you expect to hear something on the appeal? Oh, it'll probably <laughs> well, be another year or so. Uh, They're now okay. saying they'd like to go to mediation. Yeah. And uh, we're saying, no thanks. We're, we're in for a penny, we're in for a pound. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, one last question. You know, you have a lot of people that call you. You said your phones are ringing all the time with people, you know, needing help. How do you select the cases be that you do take because you have to spend a lot of time and a lot of money um, on some of these cases. So how do you make that decision? Is it, be, do you, is it between you two or? It's between the two of us. Yeah, and what, what are the, what's the criteria you're looking for? Well, um, first of all, it has to be a righteous case. Yeah. If it's not a valid case, we don't want anything to do with it. Uh, it has to be a case where we think uh, somebody's been bullied our motto is we fight bullies yeah and we are a trial lawyer firm and we that's what we do we're a small firm and we have to choose our cases to try to protect those who aren't being taken care of yeah and then if if it's a case that we think can make a difference in the world even if it's a small way if it can make the world a little safer um we love those cases and not a, every case has that kind of an impact but yeah. When we find a case like that um, where we love the clients 
and, and we love the cause and we think that if we do it right, it's really going to make the world better, yeah. uh, we're, 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 we'll work day and night on those cases. Well, thank God there are lawyers like you. Thank you. You do take your work home, I gather, right? We do. <laughs> She's my wife. <laughs> I know. Talking shop all the time. But uh, I want to thank you very much for spending time with us. This is a great case. True classic David versus Goliath. And uh, congratulations on it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.